Good afternoon, everyone. As we're waiting for people to join, we will be getting started here in a moment. So yes, good afternoon, everyone, or morning for those of you on the West Coast. I am Jenny Kean. I am RELA's Senior Executive Vice President for Member Services. We are really excited to welcome you today to the sixth in our Retail Asset Protection Webinar Series. Um, most of you know this is content that was originally developed for our AP conference, our Retail Asset Protection Conference, typically held in the spring each year. This past spring, of course, we were not able to be together in person, so we were disappointed about that, but super excited to be able to share the content to hopefully a wider group of folks than would have been able to come to the conference. So before we get started, I just have a little bit of housekeeping and I will uh, turn it over to our great speakers today. First is antitrust. So RELA, of course, operates by both the letter and the spirit of all antitrust laws. Our content today has already been reviewed and uh, we've linked our full antitrust policy statement in the chat box if anyone is interested. Um, but I, we feel uh, very comfortable that everything will be good today, but please stop us if anything comes up. You can put something in the chat or raise a hand, I believe. Uh, second, I do have a challenge to the retailers, uh, those of you on the line today. Um, yes, we are presenting this content that would have been at the conference this past year, but we're already planning for the conference for next year. So my challenge is to begin thinking about the content that might be current for next year's conference. Um, we have such great retail companies who step up every year to present at this conference, and that willingness to share is really what sets Rela apart, I think, from others. Um, so our call for proposals is now open. It is also linked in the chat box. So please just think about the success stories you may have had uh, recently, the great speakers in your company, the relevant topics that your company could bring to the event, and really encourage you to apply today or consider applying today to speak at the conference for next year. So that will be April in Washington, DC. All things go well. <laughs> Uh, finally, I do want to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, Haynes and Boone, um, and that is really my pitch. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator today, Doug Selby. Doug is the Safety Services Manager with Big Lots, and he will introduce our speakers and our session. Take it away, Doug. Thank you for that, Jenny. I've been given the opportunity to introduce our speakers for today's session. Our speakers today are Matt Deffenbach, and Lisa Prince. Matt Deffenbach is a partner at the law firm of Haynes and Boone LLP and is the chair of the firm's OSHA and Workplace Disaster Practice Group. Matt has also been a valued contributor providing information, opinions, and answering questions on numerous occasions for the RELA Safety Committee. Matt has been a previous speaker at RELA conferences, receiving high marks for his sessions. Haynes and Boone is also the sponsor of this webinar, and for that and all his previous contributions, we thank him. Matt has experience with many state OSHA programs, has successfully litigated OSHA matters across the country, including for various retailers. Our second speaker is Lisa Prince. She's represented employers uh, in OSHA and Cal OSHA matters for more than 17 years. Those employers range in size from Fortune 500 companies to small businesses. Lisa was a partner at Walter Prince LLP before starting her own firm, The Prince Firm. The Prince Firm focuses on all aspects of Cal OSHA issues, including compliance assistance, management of enforcement activity, and appeals of citations. The firm helps to proactively reduce risk, develop safety programs that comply with regulatory mandates. Lisa also been a speaker on several, several RELA safety committee calls. Lisa in Northern California with her husband and amazing daughter and Mila, the magnificent mutt. In her spare time, Lisa strives for the perfect garden and the perfect manicure. She's achieved neither. Neither, excuse me. Uh, and with that, I turn it over to our speakers. Great. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, great to be here with everyone virtually. Um, and obviously when it comes to the issues of OSHA, there's a lot going on, <laughs> not only in, in the federal world, but also um, in the California world as well. 
And so we, um, we're going to be talking about this issue of interplay of the agencies and really kind of looking at some high-level topics in terms of navigating the different systems, the federal side and the California side. Um, and then we'll talk about some specific issues, similarities, differences, and in sort of hot topics, you know, what's going on. Obviously, we'll touch on COVID, and we encourage, uh, you know, questions on that topic or any other topic. We will save the questions and the Q&A for the end of the presentation, uh, but we should have plenty of time to take some of your questions. So with that, I think we'll just get right to it. Um, and kind of kick off talking about sort of the threshold question here, which is how much interplay is there <laughs> between federal OSHA and California OSHA? And I think for those that are attending, you probably have sometimes felt the frustration level of maybe how much time you're spending on compliance <laughs> and responding to issues in California. And, and that's really the way our, our system is designed. Um, when the federal statute was passed in 1970, it, Congress allows states to adopt programs that go above and beyond the federal level. And I imagine that, that Lisa would probably tell you that California really took that to stride and has gone way above the federal level. Um, but in terms of sort of planning as a retailer, it can be frustrating because you want to have uniform programs. Um, and when you have variations at the state levels uh, with other state programs, including California, it can create challenges in doing that. Um, and so I'd say it, it is a threshold, and before I kick it over to Lisa, there really is not a lot of interplay between federal OSHA and the state of California. And, and like most of the state, there is an audit function um, where the federal government is to inquire and make sure that the state programs are meeting certain goals. But beyond that, they pretty much stay away from each other. And so um, I, I kind of want to open up and kick it over to Lisa with this idea of, how, how does it play out when you're a retailer or any employer and you're dealing with the California OSHA inspector or you're dealing with the district manager at an informal conference or settlement and you start talking about why things work for you under the federal OSHA or why you've obtained good results under federal case law or federal decisions? How does that play out, Lisa, <laughs> in terms of your experience? Well, I guess not very well. Uh, the <laughs> folks at Cal OSHA pride themselves on being unique being in that category as more effective as, so any attempt to um, refer to a, a Fed OSHA regulation or policy and practice uh, usually does not play that well with the Cal OSHA folks. So a good, a, a good practice point for everyone as you're dealing with California is make, make sure you do know what may be unique or different is, issues. And that's part of what we're gonna talk about as we jump into the rest of our presentation. So we're gonna, we're gonna be pretty high level on similarities, um, because I think it's where the differences are that you all will be more interested in terms of navigating the Cal OSHA process. But let's just start with how anything starts in the world of OSHA, which is there's some form of enforcement. So whether it's at one of your stores or one of your distribution centers, uh, when it comes to similarities, Lisa, the inspection process, how much does that look the same? If, if I'm used to inspectors showing up and eventually there's citation, how does that kind of look, federal program versus the state of California? My understanding is that's a very similar process. We're going to go through, yes, the, the walkthrough of the site, potentially or likely employee interviews, document requests. But the flow, uh, until we get to that point, and we'll talk about that at a later point, but the flow of the inspection process is very similar. And so that's, you know, that's some good news, right? Because you know how to prepare, and obviously that means you know, critical to both the federal or California, it's a six month period uh, in which the inspection takes place until citations are issued. So it moves pretty quickly. Um, and then important for both federal and California is obviously watching out for when citations hit, you have that 15 working day period to contest or appeal. Um, and that's an incredibly important deadline because there, it's very hard if you miss that contest period uh, to actually have your day in court, quote unquote. So, so at least in terms of the process, that's helpful because all the things that you're so attuned to as a retailer in getting that citation, responding to it quickly, same thing in California as with the federal program. So on, on the other kind of somewhat good news, <laughs> which you know, I know as lawyers, we're always like the bearers of bad news, 
um, but we'll try to give you some good along the way here. Uh, you will see a lot of similarity of the regulations. Now, facially, it may look different because California is one of those states that has very different, you know, regulations that are written differently in different areas, unlike some state programs that just completely adopt the federal regulations. So regulation numbers may look different, but a lot of the substance on major areas that retailers deal with are similar. And, and we're not going to go through all these, but you can see it on the screen, whether it's lockout, tagout, or PPE. You know, the rules are generally the same, machine guarding, electrical. But, you know, do watch out because there can be variations because they are written differently. And so concepts may be very similar, but make sure, as we pointed out, if you're going into an informal conference, you're wanting to talk settlement, make sure you're aware if there may be some deviations with the regulations. But for the most part, when it comes to writing your programs, uh, you'll see that your powered industrial truck program will, you know, basically be the same as will, as will many others. So that's uh, some promise and maybe not much more good news, Lisa. That may be, <laughs> may be all that, that we'll, we can give. <laughs> so I think this is a place that we wanted to park on a little bit because I know it can be a source of great frustration when it comes to recording OSHA cases and reporting cases. And, um, and that is something that we know retailers with your footprint, you deal with a lot. And we definitely will talk about the COVID work-related reporting, recording in a little bit. But, but at a high level, let's talk a little bit about, Lisa, what's happened in California, because sort of the rules on the federal side, when do you report? You know, when you've had a fatality hospitalization, um, that's actually changed in California. And so some might think, well, that's good because now there's consistency. You may have a different opinion. Can you tell us a little bit about what's changed in California on, on reporting work-related injuries or illnesses. Sure, and this is one time when we do have a little bit more interplay with FedOSHA. If FedOSHA institutes a new rule, it's a good opportunity for CalOSHA to say, well, because we have to be as effective as, we're going to go one above that now. And that's kind of what happened to us in the serious injury reporting arena. We've had a serious injury reporting rule for a very long time. Uh, but when, when FedOSHA did institute theirs, it was, again, just an opportunity to strengthen ours. So we did have some changes uh, that are of significance in California, whereas before we would need to report a, serious, a hospitalization that was for more than 24 hours. We're now in line with the federal rule that any inpatient hospitalization does need to be reported. Uh, the other significant change, we've had the, the loss of an eye. But the other significant change here um, for us, a couple of them. One, before the change, there was an exception to injuries that occurred because of a penal code violation. In other words, you know, a, a violent event. That is now included in our serious injury definition to be reported. That largely is in line with our uh, workplace violence prevention regulation that we'll touch on later. That those events resulting in serious injury do need to be reported. The most significant change, and I don't want to get into the weeds too much on this, but in FedOSHA, my understanding, Matt, is that there might need to be some contemporaneous relationship between the event and, for instance, the hospitalization. So we're looking right. at a time period. Unfortunately, in California, we did not go for adopting that portion of the rule. So in California, it is still the case that we may have a, a you know an injury today that does not result in that hospitalization for some time, a month from now, six months from now. Um, you know, according to CalOSHA, we our window to watch that uh, continues. So that could still be reportable if, you know, as a result of the injury, we have a much later hospitalization. So that's pretty significant difference we do need to watch for in California. Yeah, that's a that's a great point because I know a lot of the folks will have the same frustration of well, you know, how do you how do you keep up with somebody and, and medical privacy rules and someone can be off in a hospital and the hospital's not giving you information, <laughs> the family's got too much going on, and yet you're sort of expected to keep an eye on it. And and there there I know, Lisa, there tends to be a fair amount of failure to report citations in California. So I think that's a really good point of yours to watch out for that because, yeah, unlike the federal rule where you have that, you know, specific has to be within 24 hours of the work-related event that they're hospitalized 
or, you know, in the case of a fatality within 30 days. Now, if you have kind of on hospitalization, it's kind of wide open, and it really does mean you've got to keep watching the case, which can be challenging. So I think that's a great point. Let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, the rule on uploading the 300 A's. Um, I, think there's, I think there's alignment there now with the Fed rule and the California rule. Can you speak to that, Lisa, in terms of, you know, federal OSHA, the only thing now after the changes uh, with revisions to the rule post the Obama administration is only to upload the 300 A, no specific injury data. Is that the same in California? That is my understanding as well. Yes, we are in yeah. alignment on that. And, and one thing, too, that I think for all the attendees, and I just recently saw this, and I don't know, Lisa, if you did as well, but there's um, some evolving law right now on what happens with that data, um, because generally OSHA was taking the position that they would keep that confidential if some third-party interest group came forward with a Freedom of Information request. And I think there was a case, that was, I think it was in California, Ninth Circuit, where the court actually said, no, <laughs> hey, OSHA, you need to reveal that information if you get a request, which, you know, I think m might make employers nervous about, you know, their data being obtained. And that's a real recent development, which I'm sure we'll just continue to watch. I don't know, is that something that you saw as well, Lisa? I saw that, but that's about all I know about it as well. So we do need to continue to watch that. And I think that was always of concern during the conversation about electronic uploading. And certainly at this point, I think we're all pretty relieved that we don't have a requirement that that log information is also uh, going to be part of the upload. Perfect. And so the last, the last point I wanted to get your take on this, Lisa, is when, when an employer calls in, when a retailer calls in to report, let's say, a hospitalization or a fatality, um, I think there's some difference in terms of what happens in California. When can they expect to have an inspection based on when they've called or reported something in? Uh, well, in California, our labor code does call for an inspection in the event of a, that serious injury or fatality report. So it may not happen the same day. There is some, you know, triage going on at the Cal OSHA office. But uh, many times in the event of a serious injury or fatality, we'll have Cal OSHA on site the same day. Um, because we do need to also remember in California, our first responders are independently obligated to also report. Uh, that trip to the hospital that they think could be serious. So it could be same day, but you know, if depending on what's going on or, or what the analysis is on a, a potential continuing hazard, it could be a week or two later. But uh, we do should expect an in-person inspection on those serious cases. And that's, I think, a great practice point for everyone because it just means to have your ducks in a row and be ready when you make that report to expect, you know, that on-site coming in. Oops, I just lost my life in here. Hold on one second. <laughs> there we go. First technology issue. The lights are back. Um, yeah, and so I think that's a great practical uh, practical point, you know, in terms of what happens when you report and pre be, you know, prepared for that potential inspection. Because on the federal side, there's no guarantee, even with a fatality. And we'll talk about this in the COVID response, but the federal resources are such that a lot of times you really don't know when you'll get an inspection. Uh, and, and it may be that, you know, all you're going to get is a letter, rapid response investigation we'll talk about. So I think some really good practical points with some differences there uh, in terms of, of reporting. And then, so continuing on that theme, kind of talk about a few of the high-level uh, differences. You know, I think that probably most folks, when they've contested and they've gone through or they've participated as a witness or a representative of the company, are familiar with the general sort of litigation process of what happens. And there are some differences in California, and I think probably one of the first ones, Lisa, will turn to you, is what happens if you get um, this form in the process uh, of your investigation called the 1B, uh, 1BY? What exactly is that, and uh, why do we have danger written all over this slide? <laughs> Um, that form, and it's been probably six or eight years that we've been dealing with that. The, the idea behind the form is that we want to be able to avoid serious citation. And Cal OSHA now must send that form to an employer before they issue a serious citation. And the idea was that the employer would respond to that with information and be able to have a nice dialogue and convince Cal OSHA that they shouldn't do it. 
Uh, but in reality, this is the danger part because in reality, um, I think it maybe have over the, all of these years, maybe one or two kind of favorable examples. But more likely, it's that the responses are not given much consideration and the citations are, are issued anyway. And then the, the danger, real part, is that many of the district office managers have been very blank, very direct with me and saying, we look at those responses to see if there's information we can use against the employer, because these are considered verified responses. So it's an, an admission that would be admissible at a hearing later uh, and used against the employer as the division can do that. Um, there is, the, the form does not tell you that there's no requirement to respond. Uh, and also, if you choose not to respond, that fact cannot be admitted against you. So it is absolutely um, almost always, and maybe even always, our recommendation to not respond to these and move on with your appeal process. Yeah, that's great advice, right? Because, you know, from the employer's perspective, you've just told folks, that's one less piece of paperwork you have to fill out, <laughs> which that's a relief. But more importantly, it's that issue of early in the life stream of a case, you may not know as much. And so if you put information in this and you don't have all the facts and now you've made certain admissions, it could really hurt you in litigation. So I think that's a great point that if you get one of these, there's no requirement, no, no downside to you uh, in terms of not returning it. And there can be a lot of downside to completing it and returning it. So I think that's a really good practice point for everyone. And then this is a, we'll keep this a little bit brief, but I think it is important to know that in the federal process, a lot of you may be the person that sends in this very simple notice of contest, which is, you know, can be like a sentence. We got the citation, we're contesting it, we contest everything about it, and that probably covers you. It is a different procedural process in California. Lisa, can you talk about that just so that if a retailer is handling the, the contest uh, component, they know how to do it right so they don't look like they're kind of a stranger in a foreign land. <laughs> right. Well, a couple of the, the highlights of, of the differences is we, um, the appeal is filed with the Calosha Appeals Board in Sacramento. We're not now communicating with the district office about the appeal. They have appeal forms that you would want to use, or there is actually an electronic process for initiating the appeal um, with the appeal board. You're required to also submit the copy of the citation, and uh, you must give some information regarding your affirmative defenses. Now, this can be to some extent cured later on, but many, many appeals are filed that don't have the citations or filed late or incorrectly. And unfortunately, we see many of these dismissed. So it is, they're pretty strict about their timelines and getting these things you know, correctly submitted. Um, unfortunately, we would hope we get some more you know, communication out to employers about how to get this done. But um, that's, I think, probably the significant difference. And so just a good good practice point for everyone to you know watch out on how you handle these and make sure you do it correctly um, because there can be pitfalls if you think hey all i have to do is send a, a notice of contest to the district office that's not going to cut it so just a really a really good point in terms of what to watch out for that um, and then yeah, I, would, yep. I just want to add one thing and i think would we'll call this a similarity with your notice of contest as well as your appeal we're going to check all the boxes more or less appeal all issues on each of the citations, uh, make sure you keep your options open on that. Good, yeah, great, yeah, that's right, because on the form there's a lot that you can check, so check it all. <laughs> no, no downside. So I think kind of one of the really kind of interesting differences, if, if you're a retailer that's litigating a big issue in California, um, there are a couple of things that, I, that struck me as, as really bizarre and different. In, in the federal process, um, you know, you'll get your case docketed and a lawyer will be assigned right away. Um, and you'll go through what's a pretty familiar litigation process of discovery. There's really no timetable. The court will set some dates, but you can pretty easily change the dates. Um, Lisa, one of the things that may be great for folks to realize is there's a process now in California where cases can be expedited. 
Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? Because that can kind of throw folks for a loop um, if they were thinking, oh, hey, we'll just kind of kick the can down the road and we'll, we'll appeal, contest this uh, to buy us some time. Uh, let's, can you talk a little bit about the expedited proceedings in Cal OSHA? Um, sure. I, I think under the normal appeal process, it's probably fairly similar to what you're describing, Matt, with the period of time for you know discovery and communications, especially now, pretty can, can drag out a bit. However, in California, if a citation is classified as serious or greater, so it's serious, it's accident related, and it is not issued as having been corrected or abated, that appeal is going to be expedited. And the thought behind that, which I'm not sure it has much basis in fact, is that there is a continuing hazard on a job site and the employer has filed an appeal to avoid having to do anything about that. Um, I don't think that's the case, as I said, but because of that, we have this process by those cases are gonna be given priority and there's actually some very clear timelines associated with that wherein we're going to have a status call, a pre-hearing call, and be to a hearing within 150 days. Um, and and if, if, if abatement is a serious issue, if we can't get an agreement on what abatement looks like, sometimes we're in that expedited process and that, that needs to be the case. Other times you may have you know, an opportunity at the beginning of the appeal to verify abatement and then you know, be kicked out of that process. Yeah, and, and on abatement, that's a great point to pivot here to the second bullet point here, because I think, you know, often with retailers, because of the, of the footprint, the issue really is abatement. You know, it's, the fines are not a big deal. If, if OSHA wants a change in process and they want something done differently, you know, that can be a huge deal. And so one of the things that I think is, is really kind of, I mean, just sort of shocking, you know, from, from a layperson when you talk about this, that I think it's really good to know about is what happens in Cal OSHA in terms of your abatement obligation when you're litigating. And not to get overly complicated here, but you know, I think it makes sense to people what happens in the federal side is if you're litigating the case, you've contested it and you're in that process of litigating, the whole time you're litigating, if you lose and you appeal to the review commission, if you then lose and you go to a federal court, the whole time your obligation to abate is state. You don't have to do anything. Well, guess what, California? <laughs> <laughs> You've made that a lot more interesting. Can you yeah. talk to us a little bit about that? Well, it is also stayed in California. However, we have this, you know, the expedited that does, does you, know, you know, complicated in those serious citation cases. And I would agree with you. Sometimes it is all about abatement and understanding what Cal OSHA will be looking for as far as abatement before you resolve the case. Because we don't want, maybe we have even if it's a general citation, it's a couple hundred dollar penalty, and we want to resolve that, but what is the fix? Uh, I mean, I had one client where the fix was kind of doubling their workforce. This is not something we can do, right? Um, so understanding that is very important. Okay, great, great, great. And then I think the final sort of interesting thing too, you know, we talked about the fines are usually not a driver. They're actually gonna be more expensive in California um, compared to the federal level fines, Can you, and the classifications are different. So, you know, you may be used to uh, getting a citation on the federal side, and you're thinking it's going to be other than serious or serious, you know, hopefully it's not a willful um, or a failure to abate, but most citations are serious or other than serious. Can you talk a little bit about the differences in California with classifications and fines, uh, just so someone, you know, is not shocked when they get um, their citation? Um, yeah, I, you know, and I understand Fed OSHA is maybe coming up with their penalties. We've always been on the higher side and, again, took an opportunity to raise ours when you guys did. But uh, we have the serious citation, much similar to this. Um, but those are going to start at about $18,000. There's some reductions for, you know, for size and other issues, and they can go up, you know, more into the $25,000 range. We don't have an other than serious, but we have a general, which would kind of be our, our version of that. But also we have regulatory uh, citations that both of those would you know, carry lesser penalties. But even as a general, we can, I think now that it can get up to $12,000. So probably 
still fairly significantly higher. And of course, talking about willful uh, and repeat, we're going to have significantly higher than that. I think I just citation come through as a repeat was more than seventy thousand dollars for one. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's you know that's kind of a theme that's a great segue, right? Because one of the things that we want to talk about because it's so important to retailers are repeat. Um, you know, just like abatement is a big deal, a lot of times what you're concerned about is because of a large footprint and a lot of facilities within a state or across the federal program, really trying to avoid those repeat citations. And so let's talk a little bit about sort of the differences in California and the feds. And, and this is where there was some recent good news on the federal side, and there's a reference to a, a case here in the slide, Angelica Textile. Which, which basically, in a nutshell, one of the challenges with trying to avoid repeats, at least in the federal area, used to be that basically all that the Department of Labor had to show was same, you know, same standard. You know, you, you were cited in, in, in federal, obviously, that's across the whole federal footprint. So you have a distribution center in Texas that has a failure to do a PPE assessment, and then you have one in Georgia. Okay, it's basically the same citation, same issue, it's a repeat. But in this review commission case, Angelica, what the review commission said was, well, wait, if you can show that there are differences in terms of sort of the operations, of the nature of the hazards, of kind of the workflow, really trying to, to show why there's, there are differences beyond just the citation, you can use that to avoid a repeat. And not only that, um, what the review commission said in that case is, even if there is something that looks like it might be similar, if you actually did come in and take affirmative steps to correct it, you know, whatever your abatement was, that can be used as an affirmative defense to avoid the repeat citation. So effectively, this case gave employers, you know, two great strategies, which is to say, yeah, 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 it is a PPE assessment, but it's totally different. This facility only has a few employees and they, and they only did this operation. This one's much larger. They, you know, they were dealing with different types of hazards. Uh, and also, by the way, we fixed it you know, that basically allows you to defeat the, the repeat uh, in, in a great way that didn't exist before. And so that's super good news for our federal uh, OSHA uh, clients. <laughs> but what about in California? What's going on? I know there's been changes and, and maybe it's not so good news out there. <laughs> well, it's really not. <laughs> Once again, um, three significant changes on our repeat classification. So in, in the past, before the change, we would be looking at um, for facilities, so if we have you know different stores or facilities throughout the state, the repeat geographically would be per Kalosha office region. So we'd be really focused on that region for a repeat. The timeline was three years of look back, and it, the timeline also started at the first alleged violation, and then and then for the second. Now Matt, understand you can't get a repeat if your appeal is still on file for that first one because it hasn't become final yet. So in the past, our window for repeats, you know, if we have an appeal on file for a couple of years, can be fairly short. Um, we fixed that. Under the new <laughs> rules, the window is going to start from the cl uh, closure of your first case, and, and then so your timeline starts then, and now instead of three years, goes five. And our geographic region would be the, the statewide now, not regional. So we've expanded this possibility pretty dramatically um, because it, it's you know, maybe 18 months or two years old now. But we don't have a lot of litigation on this. And I'm, I'm hoping maybe that we could have some information like you're just sharing with us that that substantially similar issue will be more litigated now. But certainly at this point, that abatement piece, as we were saying, is going to be very important. And it's going to be, you know, kind of keeping track of what's going on in one facility, but also implementation of that abatement you know, statewide. Yeah, so that's certainly good to know because it's uh, unfortunately <laughs> what were some of the good benefits uh, they flipped in terms of California versus the Fed. So, uh, so, so it is. <laughs> So let's, let's talk about the, the kind of key difference when it comes to sort of the catch-all issue, right? Um, and in federal OSHA, I'm sure all of our attendees have heard of the general duty clause, and they've probably heard of injury illness prevention programs in California. Well, let's talk a little bit about 
kind of what to watch out for there beyond just the theory. Because on the federal side, I think it, it is harder, um, particularly given the fact that the current administration and the review commission has actually taken a view that, that disfavors the general duty clause because it, it is seen as kind of a gotcha. You know, like if, if there's no, if, if Congress is going to get a regulation passed and OSHA is going to go to the general duty clause. And, and so we, and we'll talk about this in COVID because that's really where the COVID citations would have to come from on the federal side. But at least in terms of general enforcement, we haven't seen as much general duty clause uh, during the current administration. There is still some. But injury, illness, and prevention, uh, on some cases I've handled in California, it seems to come up a lot. <laughs> and so, Lisa, can you kind of walk us through what to watch out for when it comes to IITP? Because I think most employers know, hey, you have to have one. Um, but there's that concern of what happens when it's kind of sitting on the shelf and what to watch out for when Cal OSHA comes in and asks for it and what some of those pitfalls may be. Yeah, sure. So you, you're right, Matt. Our IITP uh, regulation is used very frequently, almost, I would say, to a point of any time you're going to have uh, an injury, a serious injury, you are going to be facing, maybe in addition to other alleged violations, a citation for IITP. And it is not that employers don't have it, it's that implementation piece where we want to make sure we are documenting the elements of the program that are required. So it's going to be that hazard identification, uh, correction, training, et cetera. Um, and a couple, I think, uh, overused to say the least. And some issues we want to look at when we have an IITP uh, violation is um, implementation. So the enforcement may say anytime you have an accident, it means that you failed somehow because you didn't identify the hazard, you didn't correct the hazard. Our appeal board does not necessarily agree with that. So I, we have to look at these closely and, and make sure we're working through this on appeal, that we have the procedures and that we're implementing the procedures, but 100% uh, you know, perfection on hazard ID is, is not the standard. So we have a difference of opinion there between the appeal board and the division. Uh, another way we're, we're seeing this use is, again, kind of circling back to that abatement piece. Sometimes someone at Cal OSHA decides they want something done differently on the job site, but it is not required by regulation. So we can, again, issue this to require abatement of something other than, than what is necessarily, you know, regulatory required. We need to be cautious about that. The third thing I, I wanted to mention is having Several times I've seen you have the IITP violation, again, with maybe some more serious violations. And if the employer accepts that small one and therefore, you know, now has some record, I suppose, of an accepted citation for not having implemented their safety program, that could work against them when we're talking about defenses to the serious citation. For instance, no employer knowledge or independent employee act or, or employee misconduct as you have. So if we now have an admission of in failure to implement our program, we've now knocked some of our tools out of our toolbox. So uh, it is important to watch those very carefully and we always do recommend appealing those and working out what exactly the issues are before we accept that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. If you may think, oh, this IIPP general is only 300 bucks. I'm just going to go ahead and accept it, you know, to, to, to get that one out of the way and then fight the bigger picture. And then you just, you know, cut your knees out from under you in terms of some of your defenses that rely on you having a good program. So really something to watch out for. Okay, let's talk then a little bit on kind of the final thing on differences before we get into some hot topics um, is just some of the unique regulations. And, and I'm just going to turn this over to you, Lisa. We do have a separate slide on heat, indoor heat, outdoor heat. So mm -hmm. we can kind of get to that when we get to that slide. But in terms of, you know, wildfire, smoke, ergonomics, uh, what are some things that maybe uh, an employer needs to be aware of in California that really are unique to the state? Um, I think that the hot topic right now, I guess kind of getting ahead of ourselves, is that wildfire smoke. So we do have that. It, we have an emergency regulation that has been um, re, uh, reassessed and reinstituted as an emergency a couple times. 
and it is now again before the standards board. And the biggest issue here, and just let's all be watching this, is we all know we have PPE problems right now. We have respiratory protection problems right now. So we've been talking with Kellosha quite a bit on what their plan is on enforcing respiratory protection in times that we have that wildfire smoke. And I'll tell you this, to no agreement. So although our California employers will not probably be able to get the required protection, um, at this point, we will be held to that standard. So that conversation is ongoing and we're watching that pretty carefully. Indoor heat, uh, we do not have yet. Um, it is coming. Our expectation is the conversation, just because everything is almost 100% COVID right now, that that will be delayed. Um, or, or, yes, our exposure limits, we we'll kind of don't want to get into too much detail on that, but we do have that and it's also um, being reviewed right now. Ergonomics, we don't see too much enforcement of this because it does require the, the division to, to meet a burden of showing that there's been repeated you know, ergonomics cases or you know, injury in the same situation. And I don't know if they're unable typically to do that or just don't feel it's worth their time to put that case together. But we don't, while it exists, we don't see too much activity on that. But yes, it does. It don't, let's not forget it's there. Great. And so just to keep us moving along, and here is where we get to probably what everyone's been dealing with <laughs> nonstop, and we did promise to touch on it in terms of hot topics, uh, and that is obviously on, on COVID. And, I, you know, realizing that everyone's been dealing with this, you know, at least then I thought we could at least kind of give you the current sort of lay of the land of what to be, you know, watchful for in terms of what's going on. Uh, and, and there really is some hot off the press news in California. So let, let me just start on the federal side and say, I, I think what everyone has seen and, and you know, the, the, the data is on OSHA's federal website. And the story is this, you know, they are still getting the majority of their issues with COVID are complaints, complaint letters that they are not investigating. I think there's something like 134 open complaint investigations if you look at the data right now. I mean, they've only opened federal inspections on 838 COVID issues. Now, obviously with the statute of limitations, these can lag, but you know, that's not a lot of inspections when federal OSHA generally has over 30,000 inspections a year. So in terms of OSHA inspecting for COVID, it's still a very, very small percentage. Rather what they're doing with their strained resources and their focus on healthcare and first responders is when they're getting complaints, they're sending that letter out to the employer and saying respond to it. And of those, um, as of two days ago, there's almost 8,000 of those federal complaints and about 7,000 have already been closed. So that tells you that, that, you know, that there's not a lot of activity. Now, that's not to say that what I think retailers should be really concerned about, and there's such a patchwork going on right now, is general liability claims. And that's where, you know, there's so much litigation brought by the plaintiff's bar when there maybe has been a fatality, um, or some other, you know, catastrophic event where they're trying to allege beyond workers' compensation that there's been gross negligence or an intentional act. And, and you know, for everyone on the call, what that really means is, you know, that your exposure for gross negligence is that you're doing things that, that you should not be doing when there's some standard of duty of care. And that's where the general duty clause comes in. Um, and everything that the CDC says to do and, and, and what OSHA says in terms of you know, conduct a hazard assessment, identify if your employees are low, medium, high risk, very high risk. And by the way, everyone who's outside of healthcare can only be medium or low risk. And then Federal OSHA talks about controls, engineering, administrative. Those are pretty basic things to do. But if you're not doing those, if you're not doing what OSHA has put out on its website um, and, and doing those kind of basic things, I think that's the concern if you're in a state that doesn't have an immunity law and even those immunity laws that are getting passed, a lot of them say, well, yeah, but if it's gross negligence or an intentional act, you still can get sued. So I think that's where compliance is so important to do your best job of documenting what you've done in terms of assessment, what controls are feasible, what's not. And, and, the, and the suggested controls are, I think, doable. And I think retailers have done a good job with them. So the news is pretty good on the OSHA enforcement side right now, not a lot of it but there's still that exposure to claims 
when you're sued outside of OSHA if you're not doing those basics, whether the CDC basics, the federal OSHA basics. So, you know, a little bit of good news, a little bit of bad news. And then, uh, Lisa, what, what are your thoughts on kind of the current state of, of Cal OSHA and uh, COVID-19? Well, I think it's been largely similar. However, I'm hearing that there will be a shift um, pretty shortly, if not even, you know, in the last week or so. Uh, before I do, do get into that, Matt and I have a dialogue box where we can see questions. And although we're holding questions to the end, I would encourage you to go ahead and, and type those in if you wish, and it will give us an idea uh, about how much time that we should devote to going through those. So just invitation, if you want to go ahead and if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in and we'll, we'll get to those. Um, but yeah, similar. So what Cal, Cal OSHA has been absolutely um, just inundated with those complaints. That's been the case so far. And our updated record looks like um, in California alone, they've received over 4,000 COVID-related complaints. And the, as with Fed OSHA, they are responding with those with the letters and inviting response from an employer. I mean, in the early days of this, it really was just um, overwhelmed by the numbers of having a hard time assessing what was needed to be inspected. And then also some concern, are they equipped to go into these work sites and conduct those inspections. So a lot of their initial um, responses, complaint letters, and then the focus on healthcare as well. They have issued 71 COVID-related, the 1BY letters that we're talking about. So that would indicate an intent to issue serious citations on those. Uh, the citations have not been issued yet, but we would expect those you know, shortly. Um, they, during the month of July, all inspectors were required to work overtime to visit California work sites. Uh, this started on 4th of July weekend. On the 4th of July, they worked a 12-hour shift. So you can imagine what, what their morale looks like. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the idea was actually to provide compliance assistance. So we did consider this a good thing. They were going out you know, to the grocery stores, to the retail, everyone who was active during that time as essential and trying to provide information on compliance. And we also, I think, following a lot of the same guidance now as, as Fed OSHA would, but California, you know, being who we are, also have to have their own individual guidance. And there is quite a bit on their website. Now what I'm hearing, so I guess during that month, they did almost 8,000 inspections. And those were supposed to be that compliance assistance. They have now been directed, and I guess this is August, it's a new new month, new policy, that they're going to go back and issue citations. So they are going to go back to those facilities and, and see that the guidance is not being followed. They will be issuing citations related to that. So we're kind of all braced um, for what that looks like. I think what I'm hearing from the inspectors is they see good effort at compliance, though. So, um, so we're hoping it won't be too bad, but uh, the, the, the focus will now be on issuing citations in California. And so I think, um, you know, everyone needs to just be mindful that it may not be so bad on the citation side right now, but particularly, you know, in California and even other states, obviously everyone knows that Virginia passed an emergency standard. You know, we are seeing more activity at the state level. Uh, and so I think, you know, there may be a lot more enforcement activity just across the state over the next couple of months, uh, unfortunately. All right, and so we'll, we'll keep it brief on these final sort of hot topics just so we do have time for you all to log in with any questions. We, we uh, Lisa mentioned heat, and let's just say on the federal side, you know, California has an existing outdoor heat regulation. Lisa already talked about, you know, potential indoor down the road. Uh, on the federal side, it, it has to be, if you're talking about any kind of heat violation would have to be under the general duty clause. And that's been really difficult. We won't bore you guys with the facts of this case we put up here, but Federal OSHA, as I already alluded to, has taken a pretty critical view of using the general duty clause. And in a heat case, you know, went to that point of saying, uh, it's really hard and really hard to show that someone who may have had a heat condition, that the employer would have sufficient knowledge because of privacy laws of their pre-existing conditions, et cetera. Uh, to know that they might be a danger. Um, and so I think, you know, when it comes to federal, 
you're not going to see a lot of enforcement. I don't know, at least I know you already touched on heat. Is there anything else you want to say on kind of the heat issue in California? Um, just that it continues to be an emphasis plan in California. It is still an open issue uh, because we now only have the outdoor, what is outdoors, that's a continuing fight, and how much time does an employee spend outdoors to, to trigger this, uh, right. this regulation. Um, and still, still open, I would say to you that enforcement would take very little time to trigger this rule. Got it. And so with that, we'll move on to workplace violence, um, just because it's a topic we hear about so much. Um, and it's, it's an area where when I talk to the federal inspectors, I mean, even though there is a, a somewhat of a focus on it, there's very little citation activity that's occurring um, at the federal level. And part of that is even though there was this case that's on the screen here that was with really bad facts, um, where the commission did approve the use of general duty clause where uh, a person who was sent into a home of a violent patient they were attending, that the employer should have known that there was a hazard of this employee ended up actually getting killed. Um, but the commission still went on to say, this is very limited to these really horrific facts. And in most cases, an employer is not going to be able to know the proclivity of some environment to uh, be a place where an employee could be exposed to violence. And so on the federal side, again, even though it's talked about a lot, we don't see a lot of enforcement. But there are some differences because there's a standard and maybe even a broader standard in California. Lisa, do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of the latest and greatest on workplace violence? Uh, in California, we do have a standard. It is limited to healthcare industry. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, there is a violence in healthcare problem, as you indicated. So that does require the employers in healthcare to do various things, which I won't, won't get into. However, the relevant part here is that we do have a draft of a general industry standard for workplace violence prevention. It is not quite as, as um, comprehensive probably as healthcare, but is comprehensive. Uh, so it would require the hazard assessment, training, keeping logs, and then also some additional reporting to Cal OSHA. As with indoor heat, um, I think that's probably going to be solved a little longer because of our focus has shifted for right now, but that is in the works. I, I wouldn't, I don't, nothing is on calendar related to that and wouldn't expect something until kind of things calm down on our COVID side. Good to know, because, yeah, you know, I don't know about you, but it's something we hear about so much, but yet, you know, there, it just doesn't seem to be as much in enforcement. All right, and so then the final thing we'll touch on real quickly, because I know we have at least one question, and this is just to, to uh, I think probably a lot of folks already know, particularly in Southern California, a lot of the retailers have been dealing with a real push on foot protection, uh, particularly on the, on the warehouse and the distribution side. And the only thing, we could talk about this a lot, but, but it is, seems to be a, an issue that's really driving some of the district offices. And, and what I would say to folks is there, there have been some board cases um, where the board has said, hey, look, you know, we recognize that foot protection as a form of PPE is the last line of defense. And if you've done a correct assessment and looked at ways to engineer out or use administrative controls, that is preferred. Um, and so, but if you're, if you're going to defend yourself against one of these foot protection cases, you got to be able to show that and really be able to demonstrate why other things you're doing are protecting workers um, because it, it's a, a hot topic for sure. And I know many of you are already familiar with it, but I did want to point out that part of your defense, if you're not already doing that, is to do the assessment and try to figure out, do you have other controls that are superior than resulting on PPE? If you haven't done that, it's very hard because I know you know some of the districts when the inspectors come in, they basically say, "Oh, it's a warehouse setting with powered industrial trucks, therefore equals must have foot protection." You know, and that's not doing a hazard assessment. Um, and so obviously, you need to be able to be in a position to do that. So um, I don't know, Lisa, if you want to chime in on that, and if, if, if not, then we'll just uh, get to whatever our, our questions are at this point. Sure, that sounds good. All right. So let's see. We have um, we have one question that says. If we have an idea that an employee contracted COVID on the job site, but show minor symptoms and not hospitalized, is that a reportable? What is the guidance on inclusion, inclusion for the OSHA 300 law? And so, yeah, I mean, on the federal side, the, the agency is flip-flops, you know, on when you would have to record something. 
Um, but keep in mind that you always have to have one of the criteria, right? So if you don't have hospitalization, if you don't have fatality, if you don't have, you know, one of the triggers, you know, then just because someone has an illness, there has to be those associated reporting criteria. But really, you know, so let's assume here that you do have information, um, they have been hospitalized, uh, there has been, you know, one of those triggers, then what the federal OSHA right now says is you have to determine, and this is <laughs> really hard, right, is it more likely than not, that's the standard under the current guidance, is it more likely than not that work was the cause? And so what federal OSHA has said is, you know, if you have, if you meet one of the criteria, uh, you have to ask yourself things like, did, did all of a sudden you have a spike of employees that got COVID where no one did before, and so it looks like it must have started at work, and there's no other explanation in terms of the person saying, oh, yeah, well, I just took a trip, uh, you know, and, and was gone and, and went partying at the bar and the beach when I was on my vacation. So you're like, oh, well, maybe more likely than not, that's the cause. Um, but the federal, the federal guidance really says, hey, look, you know, do your best job. Do a good faith assessment. But we recognize it's hard to know. Um, but if it looks like it's more likely than not, and if the trigger meets, meets the criteria, hospitalization, then within 24 hours, you know, if they, if they say, look, I, last time I was at work was a week ago, well, no, they can't, it can't be caused by work because they've been, you know, away from work more than 24 hours. Uh, we've had fatality cases where the fatality has been, unfortunately, you know, two months after they were at work. Well, it's, that's beyond 30 days. So it's not something that would meet the, the reporting criteria uh, for your logs or to report it. Um, so, but Lisa, what are your thoughts in terms of the California response to that? Because I know this is one that drives people crazy because yeah. How do you know if someone got COVID at work? <laughs> right, right. And um, so it's it, it very similar, but again, California wants to have their new, own nuance on it. So just walking through both parts of that, the report to Cal OSHA. So on the report, it would be similar. We need to look at, do we have a trigger? So that hospitalization in our scenario would be the, be the trigger. Um, and in California, it would our, our standard would be was the hospitalization um, or illness occur in the workplace? So are we having somebody fall ill and go to the hospital? Probably, probably mm -hmm. not, but I guess it's possible. Or in, connect, in connection with the work, in connection with work activity. So that's where we're going to have to look at this. Was COVID, you know, was it associated with or, or you know, related to work? Uh, and I, I would also agree, we need to document that analysis. So do we have more than one employee as uh, you know, working with the public? What in controls do we have in place? Where Fat OSHA would say, kind of do your best analysis, California has been saying, let's err on the side of reporting and reporting. <laughs> so this is also a conversation we're having at, within Cal OSHA. Both of these issues, and certainly the recording, which we're doing the same analysis, we want to know, you know, likelihood of this have has been at work, work related, those should be a standard across the nation, right? That's the point. We want to keep those yeah. uniform. We want that same analysis. So although guidance by Cal OSHA says what's air to reporting, we do have a, a conversation going on about that and trying to get them back in line. Uh, they have said, you know, it is the same standard as that OSHA on that point. But the best advice I think we can give is doing the analysis to support your decision on recording and just keeping that documentation probably the best we could do at this point. Yeah, I think that's, that sounds like good advice and agree with that. And, you know, and just so everyone knows too, that in federal OSHA went out of its way to say this in the guidance, just because you're putting it in, in your logs is not an admission that you violated the law. You know, they, they made that really clear. And so that kind of goes to that, well, if you are to err on the side of recording it, it doesn't mean you've admitted in a general liability claim, oh my gosh, this actually was work related. It's just that you're, you're putting on your logs out of an abundance of caution. So I think that's helpful. Um, well, hey, that's actually right dead end of time. I mean, this never happens with lawyers that we stay on time. So, you know, miracles never cease. So uh, we'll kick it back to you, Doug. Thank, thank you so you. much, Matt. Matt, Lisa, thank you both so much for all the information you shared with us. I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did as well. I'd also like to thank the audience for participating and remind everyone to register for the next webinar in the series, Legal Liability for Acts of Violence in Retail. 
understanding the risks. That's on Wednesday, August 26th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Thanks again. Everybody stay safe. Thank you.